Ja sam u Banja Luku došao prije sat i po vremena, odmah sam u hotelu Bosna našao moju sobu i nakon toga sam pješke došao ovdje, a na putu vamo sam napravio jednu malu rundu, osnovna škola Braća Pavlić, Stajao sam odmah izvan hotela Bosne, gledao gdje je nekad bio mali Borčev stadion, gdje smo igrali lopte vrlo mnogo. Onda Boska, Kastel i naravno Jazavac, pozorište. Zadnji put kada sam ja sjedio na vašem mjestu bilo je, ne znam, negdje kraja 80. godina, Kino Vrbas, ako se ne varam, film je bio Hajde da se volimo, najnoviji, odnosno posljednji, najposljednji novi val bivše jugoslovenske kinomatografije, ali dosta o ljubavi, počet ćemo o arhitekturi, iako su to u stvari, to je jedno te isto, jel? Za ljubav i za arhitekturu treba jedan investitor, neko s parama, treba neko sa idejama, neko ko zavodi i naravno neko ko vjeruje u nekoga. Evo ovako, pošto sami vidite, meni je malo teško govoriti na našem jeziku, tako da ćemo ovo predavanje sada okrenuti na engleski, između ostalog prijatelji iz Grčke s kojima sam studirao u Njujorku su ovdje, tako da podijelimo materiju i iskustva iz arhitekture. So, now the lecture will be in English um, and it's called Making of the Project. Uh, with project, I actually mean both a real project on one side, but then also a project of kind of a bigger project that you do within your career. This first slide is a continuation of the advertisements. Uh, it's from 1980, a Norwegian advertisement, and it actually shows the role of what architect wants to be. Architect Anske Drom, the wishful or, or the dream of an architect is not to do anything else than to make buildings look beautiful which in my opinion is a very narrow understanding of what architecture is and how it should be. Next slide. As Igor also already has mentioned, we do research, we do speculations, uh, mostly uh, of uh, kind of urban problematics and also we do construction because in my opinion the realization, the, the best realization of your dreams and the intellectual work is through construction or making buildings real. Uh, here, my lecture will be about housing. And specifically, I will touch upon the project in Vienna. I will only talk about the project Vienna precisely because housing is site-specific, uh, conditions that you encounter when you do housing are the conditions specific or bound to one context. So if you just take a look on your left side, does this function? Uh, okay, uh, tip, what I'm saying is that on your left you see how a plan of a building in Vienna is articulated, uh, very gracious common spaces, different scales, whereas the production of uh, housing in Norway is totally different. It's uh, very much conditioned by the private capital and it also does that the common spaces are reduced to the minimal. So basically, uh, when you talk about housing, you should be site-specific and very thorough exploring one specific situation. Uh, of course, what is enchanting in Vienna is also the uh, role of housing in relation to the overall politics. Just as an example, the building that uh, I worked on, or we made, was opened by uh, Doris Bures. Uh, she was at the time um, 
president of the Austrian parliament, and she came in a political campaign uh, one week before the last elections to promote both the party and also to give some um, uh, uh, advertisement for the developer. Because uh, for my Norwegian uh, situation or perspective, this is unimaginable because politics and investments are not made so um, visible related to each other. It should be, or it would be almost a corruptive to do something in Norway. So, prologue. Um, the year, as you see, is 2005, and I will introduce with the project in, uh, or the competition project that I won uh, in 2005. By also, I will have to say one more thing: the project was done also in collaboration with another Banja Luka native, Sinisha Lecic, my very good friend at the time. Uh, yeah, you know how architects win competitions, split, and yeah. Anyhow, so now we are in Vienna in the 23rd Bezirk uh, in area called Leasing. And you see the, the site is over there, the center of Leasing uh, neighborhood or Bezirk is here. The main station or the railway passes through. Uh, so the site itself was left over after um, railway container unit, which was still kept on the other side of the street. So, as you see here, the site again, 250 meters long, 50 meters wide, and Hello? Yeah. So, yeah. And then the part of the program was also um, passage or passarella over the railway. So, you have to come at the 17 meters height to pass over the railway, but also the FAA ratio was set to 200%. And by the way, uh, I don't know how many of you know European competition. Anyone? Yeah, two, great. Because you, every second year it's arranged uh, all over Europe, so you can choose in between 50 different sites. And uh, my idea was, let's find a site that is the worst. Basically, let's find a site that has absolutely no quality. And that's what this site really have or have. One side you have a... 250 meter long existing structure, destroying its uh, eastern side, and then on the other side you have containers uh, in four to five uh, stories. So the simple idea was, let's make the access to the passarella as a way to organize the building as a adjacent or, or street that rises up and by the same token make it as an organizer for the future housing. So basically that you live in a typo uh, topography. So you don't live in a single building but you live in a large scale housing complex which has spatial qualities but also enhances other ways to live. In ideological terms, architecture is a question of ideology just like anything else, and architecture is also a question of politics just like anything else. So uh, my preference was to imagine the future building as some, ki some kind of twisted unité bloc par le Corbusier. We will come to this reference later on. Building in itself was very much bound to its time, 2005-2006, with its uh, landscape uh, uh, dimension, with its um, structural organization, but also in a way of um, kind of uh, creating its own context. This 
cozy, small-scale street is something else than you see on the outside, but also the street itself reinvents what the street, in classical European terms, is ground floor where everything happens here. We talk about street that passes through the building and creates its own urban touch. Building in itself a, a mega structure, I know it's unrealistic, but still it was a uh, almost uh, intellectual satisfaction to do something like this. Of course, when reality knocks on your door, then you have to take a couple of steps back and start reimagining what is important and what is uh, possible and also enhance the reality of housing in Vienna. So the main kind of uh, constraint was to get really what, we, what do we have to do and try to reimagine the project not in the same shape but actually in a more or less similar approach to city, to housing and to uh, collective. So, the first step in this process was how to, uh, or to learn from your own heroes. And in that sense, belief and disbelief in architecture was a starting point. Of course, going back to the modernist idea, for example, as a young student, I was enchanted by such reference or by uh, Kenzo Tanke, which I assume everybody here knows, not because of the design, but primarily because of its belief in the fact that architecture can do uh, bigger things than only one single building. You don't build buildings, you build cities through the buildings that you implement. Uh, second, I must say, uh, reference here was more from the Scandinavian context, um, Arctic City by Ralph uh, uh, Erskine, where actually he was proposing to reinvent the way to live in an Arctic context, where he really worked on almost these dialectical relationships of indoor, very simple indoor, outdoor, social contact, privacy, artificial, uh, natural, and so forth, where the whole kind of thinking was based almost, I would say, on Hemingwayan simple facts, this or that, instead of in postmodern sense, oh, it could be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, almost like a rap song, yeah. But nevertheless, hello, yeah. Nevertheless, the last uh, example that I will touch upon here is by uh, Candelis, Josik and Woods, which also kind of the structuralist or Siam uh, 10 uh, movement from the 1950s and 60s, which really gave uh, another way of thinking about large scale. Uh, and also kind of formally, really, really kind of uh, heroic in the way how uh, building is articulated and also how private and public spaces are arranged. Of course, there's always but. Still, there's another um, difference within this reimaginative pro process of reinventing the project was, uh, was kind of this Italian radical movement which actually was mo very much denying architecture its primal position but actually giving or giving the urbanization forces its own or um, their own uh, force to enhance what the built environment should be. And of course, almost this abstract understanding of urbanization um, forces uh, made me think that basically, how can we make uh, architecture without being a designer? How can we make a framework for future housing without uh, being very much trying to uh, do the kind of softness of the situation. The project itself became a, a dialectical relationship between uh, a carpet or reimagined project, the atrium houses, small scale, uh, living on one side, the carpet, why does this does not work? Oh, so. so the lower part and then uh, the um, 
the lamella on the other side, kind of working within uh, functional, functionalist uh, ways of thinking. So basically, the housing itself became uh, became a project that was um, made of collision between two ways of living, instead of being only one way, uh, primarily given to one type of people. Building in itself reminds you, I think, of 1950s and 60s. In a way, it's very brutal, but it's also very much organized around kind of its uh, urbaniz urbanization or kind of infrastructural aspects, uh, where kind of how do you work, how do you uh, move in the building, how you distribute the square meters, also movement, but also how do you organize apartments in, the tot in its totality. The housing itself, or the, pet, the, the lower part, the carpet, as I call it, became almost like a schematic design, uh, design of a small scale units uh, uh, enhancing a carpet uh, dense living, but also extremely rational. On one side, having the starting point, one basic um, footprint that evolves and becomes uh, iterated in different, oops, becomes, uh, oh, so like this. So even though it's the same footprint, it, because of the position of the unit, it becomes either two-story, two two-story with an extension, three-story, and also four of these units were connected into one hole, and then you get the clusters. So basically starting from almost like a basic point, basic cell, and building the project further on. Oops. So the project in itself, beautiful context as you can see, uh, railway on one side and the horrendous large building on the other, and a little bit smaller project in between. Why does this does not work? Okay, so, but uh, I see that previous times, uh, the days of architecture were focused more on a small scale, but what my kind of approach here was, or my uh, approach anyhow in my professional career is what, the poten what are the potentials of the large scale? How can we reimagine what large scale is? And it's nothing new. Uh, it is something that was already uh, been written about, but what kind of my starting point here was to discuss the, what large scale can do, and that is, uh, for example, typological mutation. What does that mean? When buildings become, you start with a uh, new typology or given typology, and then when this building becomes bigger, it's not that it only gets scaled up, it gets totally different ways and the dynamics within. It gives totally different potentials to, to be implemented, but also what it does is that it also creates a context on its own. So basically, instead of being contextual, looking just like your next door building, it gives you potential that reinvent the context both within, but also from the outside. This is, as I said, nothing new. I mean, here I found inspiration by Rem Kolhas's bigness essay, which, where he talks about large-scale architecture as architecture of its own uh, uh, material uh, constraints and also totally different potentials. But of course, everything goes back to history uh, or, uh, for example, this, the one of the first ones to discuss the large-scale Architecture was Ludwig Hilbersheimer in his Metropolis Großstadt Architektur, where he actually talks about the, how the city in itself has its own rules of uh, creating architecture and its constituent parts. And of course, you can never talk about architecture if you don't talk about Corbusier. So the, one of his uh, main works, Unité Block, is actually one of the most clear examples how what large scale really means is that the building in itself gets city-like qualities. It means that architecture in itself can do something more than be only a, uh, a 
um, aesthetical form that you've seen on the introductory part. And just some aspects from that pr project was that is that actually it also puts in motion what and how living can be and how it can be achieved through a structuralist way of thinking, but also what building in itself is within the whole landscape of the existing city, being almost like a land art element within the landscape of nature. Again, the project itself uh, tried to enhance this quality of the large scale. Basically, it tries to enhance what does it mean to have a typological mutation, but also what it means to have its own context. On one side, the atrium houses is a compact living, or it's a compact building of size 50 times 130 meters. And by saying that, it also offers totally different ways of re-engaging the single uh, unit with the all, but also it creates different spatial qualities. So basically, on the outside, the building itself is very confrontational to the to the outside context, it almost turns its back, but then on the inside, it's almost like a small village trying to enhance different, um, <coughs> different scale, scales and also different qualities. So basically, even though the large scale shape is, or form, mega form, as uh, Kenneth Frampton would call it, is uh, super rigid, on the inside, it's very soft. Uh, just to... Uh, quote Barack Obama when he talks about Joe Biden, he is tough on the ins outside, but he's very soft on the inside. So, and then Lamella in itself, this is an earlier iteration than what actually got built, but we will get to it. In, in itself, Lamella, it, it's not just a sing large building where you have a stairwell going up and then division between the apartments. It has its own spatiality, it has its own relationship, it has its own programmatic or strategic placement of other programs. I know that, for example, I was born in uh, Kineze Polska Street, <laughs> Kineze Polska 15 in Boric, H2. You all know that that building is also 130 meters long. And uh, actually what that building, is, even though it's big, but it does not have the quality of the large scale precisely because it's um, kind of, it has no other um, implications on the vertical communication, common spaces uh, than uh, any other smaller building. Here what I'm kind of talking about is that the building itself becomes an event, that you have different layers of activities but also kind of different potentials how to articulate the uh, intermediary spaces. The inside of the building in the latest iteration is vertical space uh, going from the kind of ground floor which is very timid, which is, uh, has no qualities. Uh, you move up and then you get to the top floor where you have on one side uh, urban agriculture where every each of the residents can uh, grow their own vegetables and all infrastructure is also placed there to to enhance these activities but pe perhaps the most important thing is that you have also the swimming pool at the top which of course if you know uh, Austrian subsidies that's also part of that game and of course the building has no people but Rumor says it that in the weekends during the swimming season, it's just like thermal baths of Laktashi, where I used to frequent when I was in my formative years. Of course, the worst, uh, the, one of the most important things when you talk about large scale and also when you, when you kind of do a project. I won the competition when I was 28 years old. Uh, I lived in Norway, the project was in Vienna, so suddenly you have to move from the top of the Europe, which by the way on a colloquial language among the Bosnians in Norway is called on the screw because that's where the metal part around the globe gets into the globe. Uh, so being up there, 
relating to one of the largest developers in Vienna, VNC, with relation to the high-ranking politicians in Austria, suddenly it becomes an um, endeavor in its own. Basically, it becomes also something that dictates how the project should be conceived, how it should be translated, but also how it should be realized. So in a way, how do you think of large-scale architecture and housing in terms that it's also realizable? How can you talk about the meeting your clients when you actually have very knowledge of the rules and the games that are done in Vienna? But of course, being an architect, you are very, or you should be trained to encounter certain type of uncertainty because architecture is an uncertain practice. The first moment when this uncertainty disappears is the moment when uh, Doris Buras opens and unveils the building. So in a way, the project is conceived in kind of what, the, what happens when you go from here to here to here. Of course, everything started by trying to find knowledge. When the restart of the project started in 2008, 2009, one of the first things that I actually did on purpose is to contact some of the local architects just to get some simple insights. How do you treat the numbers? How, can you, how, how do you treat the numbers of uh, used or the a gross area relation between net area, how do you kind of, how do you break the numbers or the Excel sheet so that the project has any kind of potentials to live. So one of the architects who actually was, is still influential, Walter Stelzhammer, gave me some simple rules. You do this, you do that, make, uh, it's almost like break and slova. Okay, mass distribution, what this, was that this whole kind of numeric exploration of potentials became um, translated in a form. So basically, how can you make a project that is so flexible so that it kind of uh, enhances different, potentially different scenarios? So on one side, uh, it was to create a lamella or the housing slab, which is... Uh, flexible or kind of uh, interchangeable with the, with the carpet, so that uh, depending on how much square meters is one side, uh, makes it possible that you can kind of change this, in a way, this, uh, this, this line here. The relationship between, oh, no. This line was kind of interchangeable, going up and up and down. So in a way, project, yes, it became assembled between two parts, but still it could be, one part could be slightly bigger, slightly smaller, and it gave kind of flexibility that um, is, was needed at the time. But also this approach made possible thinking of architecture, because I think all when you struggle with numbers, when you struggle with your investors, you should always think of what actually am I doing and what is the final result? What, can, uh, what will this building be and where to put your money on? Where do you, what do you bet on? What is the thing that you, cannot, what, what, that you cannot have a compromise about? And in a way, the project became guided by three architectural facades, the carpets, uh, uh, the roofscape on one side, the weave of the lamella facing the park, and then the brutalist grid facing the containers at the, uh, facing the, the railway. So in a way, in very simple terms, the, the roofscape it became almost like an abstract composition of elements. The brutalist uh, side became super simple, but still focused on the materiality of the uh, raw concrete and play between a vertical scaffold or vertical and horizontal 
um, uh, footprints of the of the scaffolding, and of course the kind of the image that project is mostly known about because actually it people love sweet things <laughs> the 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 weave. Uh, the project itself, as you can see, also underwent different uh, iterations. It kind of it showed that it's possible to think of housing in different manners, but still, or in one particular manner, but through different iterations. But one of the most important things is that the project to, to mention here is that the project unfolded for some six, seven years, and this is kind of the time sheets that we had have of the design process in the office. As you can see, first five, six years, we were working sporadically on the project. And uh, first, when we got the official contract in 2012, end of 2012, beginning of 2013, that the pro production of the project became kind of more systematic and more real. Kind of all these different, within this uh, Tour de Vienne, as you can see, the life of Lamella had different iterations. And actually, it, um, yeah. But of course, what I learned in this process is also that when you think things are done, finished, they are never done. When we submitted to Grünstix by Rad for the first time, which is the subsidy commission in the city of Vienna, then they said that our calculus was not sufficient. Basically, our calculus did not take into account that the lease on the land already has been spent for uh, 10 years, so we had to increase, and the lease was supposed to be on 100 years, so we had to increase project by some 10 to 15%, which actually means to increase uh, net housing area by some uh, 15 to 2,000 square meters, which is really drastic. And of course, the other thing is that when your investors write an email, start an e write an email with Mr. Muzinovich, then you know nothing is serious. But when they start, hello Mirza, then you know you have a problem. So the work on the Lamella was uh, continued and Lamella was actually totally, or on the internal side, reformulated uh, from going, from having two atriums facing the the rail yard to becoming kind of almost too brutal inner court which you have seen or inner space that you have seen some earlier images. Of course, housing also, atrium housings, houses also were expanded. We got some more uh, housing on the park side, which was also possible by the regulation plan. And, um, the, but the project actually kind of got this vertical space, uh, which always had facing or faced the, the atrium houses. The brutal facade was even further strengthened, and also the red, the red housing, which actually the developer was really against to have it red. But in a way, what I can uh, really was appropriate instead of just making it uh, uh, blend the rest of the project precisely because it was some kind of processual mistake. It had to be uh, made in red. So the, the atrium also received an additional floor. Or, yeah. So, but the, at the end, the project got the, 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 the subsidies. Uh, uh, by the wind and uh, but the other thing what I'm going also interesting not to brag is that it got the highest score on architecture where there was the youngest team actually working on it. but on the other side doing the economy and the uh, ecology and all these serious stuff where you had old timers working on it it received much lesser score what should be also thought of within this project was actually how do you govern the process when you talk about housing? Because it's very easy to become very pragmatic about, oh, how do I design an apartment? How do I put the vertical communication? How do you solve all these constraints that are uh, given by the real life? 
what this project also tried to encounter was all the time, there were like two stories. One story that was for the developer and for the, uh, yeah. For, but the other story was actually for us in the office to talk about uh, housing in kind of ideological manner. What is it that we are doing and how can we try to maintain it further on in the project? And also what, when I look now in retrospect, this is by the way a book of 2,000 pages where we collected all different hand-ins that we had or exchanged with the developer uh, for in the course of uh, some 10 years. So what we kind of, it, it's almost kind of everything that, almost like a Georges Perec story of the project. Uh, but what I kind of find that this diagram Actually, this diagram shows, is in a nutshell, what this is all about. And my last, um, perhaps uh, my last chapter in this lecture is challenge the social, individual, individualizing the collective. Usually we think of architecture as something very static. We usually think of architecture as something uh, exclusively aesthetic. But I also think of architecture as something extremely political which can be discussed in, uh, uh, is it really that possible that architecture is political? Because on one side, architecture depends on the consensus of all different involved parties, investors, architects, engineers, politicians, and all that. But on the other side, side, I think architecture is political precisely because it treats the way how we live. Because architecture is, creates um, or influences human condition. And with that sense, I think every project that is done should be uh, seen through this uh, prism. So how does this relate to the project? On one side, we can talk about other programs than housing in relation to housing, uh, additional programs, and how do you place them, where do you place them, but also type of outdoor areas, because in the outdoor areas at the end is where you meet your neighbor. That's one side, but the other side is also how do you articulate the private areas connected to each of the housing units. So if you talk about public spaces, of course this is an older diagram than what actually got realized. What our imperative for the project was to create this mega large scale form as porous as possible. So basically to create different uh, situations and conditions where you can meet your neighbor, where you can kiss your neighbor, and also where you can argue with your neighbor. Because it's not always honeymoon uh, uh, atmosphere. It got translated in a system of different outdoor spaces, some very slim and vertical, some um, kind of uh, also small scale, uh, very much integrated with the greenery, uh, the main pathway through the project with different light conditions. Of course, then again, the little plaza for the children, uh, where you kind of see also the red, um, the red uh, housing, but also to your left is also the the library or the communal space within the building itself, which you see also on the corner here, and also an uh, auditorium stair where you can sit, where actually the brass band was playing on the opening. Of course, then the project also suggested a larger park just outside the Lamella, parkour park, where you can do other types of activities, but also where you can, if you use and you make noise, you can irritate your neighbors uh, that have apartments looking on it. And at the top floor, again, the urban agriculture, where you have, again, totally different overview of the situation, but you also can meet your neighbors uh, doing the, the, your vegetables, growing your weed, and eating your, what shall we say, goodies. Of course, and then you dive in the apart in the swimming pool, and then later you can hide behind the wooden, fast furniture. The private spaces of the building itself uh, comes, how do you articulate the plan of a singular uh, housing unit? 
in relation to its outside. Outside that it, um, uh, it is connected to the in the So as you see in the lamella, you have this uh, zigzag, which I was really sad, with, but now I really hate it because the only image of the project is that image. Kind of I'm brutal guys. I like more the grid. But anyhow, the the apartments were done. Uh, kind of the this uh, zigzag was done on one side to create a situation where you can see both to him and to his wife, but also that you can also give different um, that you can also get different lighting conditions. You can be on the here on the on the tip of the bow on the balcony, but you can also hide yourself within. In a way, the lamella itself, it becomes kind of architectural statement where you see your neighbors and on the, one of the openings, there was an older lady that moved in one of the apartments and she was really happy because of the situation that she could uh, both see the neighbors, but also be very, very secluded. And kind of my favorite view of the zigzag is where you don't see zigzag. But I also think that this would be a perfect setting for the follow-up of Titanic movie where uh, DiCaprio and Kate Winslet stand on each of the sides and bow to the new future. Of course, the, the housing, the atrium houses, as you can see, the, the atrium itself is uh, articulated with the ground floor. Oh, sorry. So, so basically, the doors now. There's also a door here. So actually, every the whole ground floor can be open to the to the atrium. You live in a highly dense situation, but still you have your own private little garden integrated with the green, and where you can articulate your own interests. Uh, that's one side, but also basically the unit in itself always gets, or uh, what I kind of find interesting is this dualism of absolute inside, absolute private, and then you get the, also some view out on the hardcore situation of the railway. But at the end also, it's not only one type of uh, um, apartments in relation to each to private space, but also the fact that apartments in Lamella and apartments or in atrium houses are exposed to each other because the houses here, these apartments in atrium houses are much bigger than the ones in Lamella and then also exposes different, uh, different types of people. At the very end, I will end with, uh, because I started with, with the, another commercial. I started with the commercial, and I said, let's finish with the commercial. And this is a commercial that is 40 years old by Bernard Schumi, former dean of Columbia University. And uh, what kind of it condenses in a very elegant way is this fight of making architecture that is about um, cre uh, kind of... Uh, fighting the constraints and finding the pleasure of getting out of the constraints while creating architecture. At the end, yeah, this is the last image and I think I will finish here. Thank you very much. Stvarno smo uživali i imali priliku da vidimo kroz samo jedan, ali zaista, zaista veliki projekat, ovaj cijeli proces. I zapravo to je ono što me najviše zanima, proces projektovanja. Vidimo da je tu bilo nekih deset godina, dvije hiljade stranica razmjene komunikacije sa developerom ili poduzimačem, investitorom, ne znam kako mi to zapravo najtačnije prevodimo. Međutim, da li je postojala neka komunikacija između građana, između korisnika prostora, između stanovnika koji će 
tu živjeti ili koji već žive i da li možda nakon izgradnje objekta, nakon svega što ste prošli, na neki način pratite uticaj te velike razmjere na taj dio grada ili na sam grad? Evo ovako, prilikom projektovanja, znači dok smo projektovali projekat, nije bilo razmjene mišljenja i dijaloga sa budućim korisnicima, odnosno stanovnicima projekta. Ali ono što je, ja sam u oktobru bio ponovo u Beču zajedno sa studentima iz Osla i znači godinu dana nakon što se projekat otvorio i ljudi su uselili, ono što me vrlo intrigiralo je to da su već neki počeli da mijenjaju recimo balkone, da dodaju zavjese. Da vam pravo kažem, meni u prvi tren mi je bilo ono krivo, pa ljudi, ja sam deset godina na tome prebeo i onda dolazi neki, dosta ljudi sa Balkana isto živi, ovdje dolazi ovaj... Ali ne, ja mislim da su lokalni Austrijanci to, ne, full blooded koji su to mijenjali, ali onda u drugom, odmah nakon toga sam počeli, pa bez obzira što se, što su počeli to raditi, to i dalje nema neke, nema nekog velikog uticaja na šta je projekat i kako je artikulisan i u estetskom smislu i u prostornom smislu i na koji način je koncipiran kako treba da se koristi. Tako da, moj pristup projektu je bio ono što udrijače, manijače, onda bude što rigidniji na neki način, ali i dalje da otvara mogućnost variacije i mogućnost nečeg drugog. Hvala. Mislim da Isidora sigurno ima pitanje jer ona je prosto takva. Poslije ćemo dati priliku i vama. Pa imala bih puno pitanja, ali s obzirom da ćemo posle toga imati panel diskusiju, ne bih da dužim. Uglavnom, bio mi je vrlo zanimljiv ovaj pristup i to poređenje arhitekture u početku i ljubavi. Tako da, zaista je bitno da poznajete projekat, a isto tako i osobu, da biste mogli da je razumete. I ja sam sad nekako već razumijem ovu ideju ovog projekta čitavog, koji ste nam detaljno objasnili. Tako da, još jednom, dakle, pohvale na pristupu u predavanju. A ono što mene interes jeste large scale, velika razbira uvijek počeva na nekim velikim idejama. I vi u ovom svom radu neki oslonac tražite dosta u 60. i 70. godinama i mislijocima koji su promišljali arhitekturu u to vreme, a to vreme je vreme velikih ideja. A velike ideje pogotovo ukoliko ne znate, na primjer, vaše buduće korisnike, često počivaju na nekim univerzalnim vrednostima. Da li možda, da li smatrate da postoje univerzalne vrednosti u stanovanju, ne samo u stanovanju u prostornom smislu i koje bi to bile, koje vi primenjujete kada pristupite nekom projektu? Naravno, univerzalne ideje su uvijek prisutne, ali ono, recimo, Postoje dvije diskusije što se tiče diskusije o stanovanju. S jedne strane je pitanje projekta u cijelini, na koji način afirmišemo određene vrijednosti da susjedi, odnosno komšije, vide jedne druge, na koji način su dimenzionisani zajednički prostori, a naravno s druge strane je diskusija o samom stanu. Znači na koji način mi možemo pristupiti projektovanju stambene jedinice. I ja mislim da u jednoj i drugoj diskusiji postoji univerzalnost. Za mene, recimo, što se tiče stambene jedinice, je vrlo važno organizacija stambene jedinice. Tako da se reducira prostor hodnici, recimo, da se reducira, da se stvori mogućnost gdje možete ostaviti objesiti slike i da imate dovoljno dimenzija, da ne bude sve nekako smušeno, nego da postoji funkcionalno stvaranje tlocrta stana. Recimo, ako ja usporedim tlocrte stanova u Norveškoj, koji se projektuju danas sa tlocrtima koji su 
se pravili, ne znam, 50. i 60. godina. Velika je razlika, između ostalog je razlika ta što, što je jedinica stambena se smanjila po broju kvadrata, a ujedno se i smanjila način na koji se koristi, odnosno promijenio se način na koji se koristi stan. Tako da, da stanovi danas, ako vidite u prosječnim projektima u Norveškoj, koji je baš proizvod neoliberalne ekonomije, koja ima i svoje pozitivne, negativne uh, uh, posljedice, je taj da, da stanovi su, da stanove vrlo teško namjestiti, jer jedan put imate uh, spavaću sobu sa dva ulaza, a krevet je između oba dva ulaza, tako da, razum, to je Lajla Losnin koji se zove, koji je ono, najgora stvar koja postoji. Tako da, univerzalne vrijednosti postoje, ali opet je pitanje na koji način mi univerzalne vrijednosti kao arhitekti možemo zadržati u svotoj borbi prema investitoru, prema drugim uh, projektantima, recimo, u Norveškoj svaki stan mora da ima protupožarne ove sprinkler e, i to mijenja skroz organizaciju na koji način možete, koje prostorije treba biti po koje i tako dalje. Dobro, neko pitanje iz publike? Evo imamo pitanje, nada je tu da dostavi mikrofon. Dobro večer. Interesuje me, nisam primijetio na grafikama, da li je bila neka korelacija vezano za parking prostore, budući da je to trenutno identifikano kao najveći problem u svijetu, taj suburban sprawls i walkable cities. Da li ste imali, pošto je 2005. rađeno nekako zahtje vezano za broj predviđenih automobila koji moraju ići na tu površinu. Da, čita podrum, u stvari veći dio podruma su je parkiralište. Ako se ne veram, 1,5 ili 1,2 je automobila bilo po stambenoj jedinici. Tako da, ono što je interesantno sa podrumom parkiralištem, podzemnom garažom je taj što je ona morala da dobije saobraćajnu signalizaciju, čisto zato što je projekat tako veliki. Mislim, što se tiče normi za parkiranje, to su norme koje smo mi dobili od banke za subsidije i naravno od strane grada Beča, odnosno to što je regulisano u regulacijonom planu. To je to. Mislim, nikada nije bilo sada neki veliki promjena što se tiče parkirališta. Samo znam da imamo više mjesta za parkiranje nego što je potrebno i to onda, i ta mjesta se onda iznamljaju u susjednom bloku. Znači, ja. Tako da, ja. Hvala. Hvala mir za zasad. Nastavit ćemo dalje na panel diskusiji koju će moderirati naša Nevena Novakovica AGGF-a. Hvala.